Now we're going to talk about how they specifically, the colonists, uh, are going to develop, uh, well, first of all, the colonies, but how they're going to develop a sort of independent identity, uh, one that is fixated on enjoying the same privileges um, and civil opportunities that the English are uh, able to enjoy as uh, English and then British citizens. When I say British, by the way, I mean when uh, after 1707, when England itself, uh, along with Wales, are merged with Scotland uh, with the Unification Act, so, or Acts of Union. Uh, then we notice, no, uh, refer to it as Great Britain because that's what the name of that island is. So anyways, um, prior to 1707, it would be England, uh, but after 1707, it's Britain. So uh, increasingly, they're going to develop these colonial governments. They're going to be increasingly independent. We'll talk about that. Uh, and they're going to sort of expect to be granted those same privileges and rights uh, that are granted to the members of parliament and citizens uh, of Britain itself uh, that are going to be not granted, even though they should be, uh, to the British citizens of the colonies. So uh, let's first talk about why most of these guys came over here and then why they would uh, they set up the things that they set up. So uh, we'll focus first on one of the major issues uh, and reasons for people leaving England, and that's going to be religious oppression. So we're not talking the levels that you've heard of in the past with uh, Christianity like Catholicism when they would, you know, uh, really uh, crush any sort of dissent that disagreed with their opinions using the Inquisition and, um, you know, torturing people and burning them alive uh, or, you know, some of the other more uh, serious instances of religious oppression like um, uh, the way some religions are treated when they're taken over by a Muslim uh, state, uh, whether they're given second class citizen status uh, or they are uh, essentially forced to uh, forced to convert or die. Uh, and there's lots of other examples of that too. Clashes um, in India, in China, specifically when they wiped out Buddhism uh, early on uh, in the Tang Dynasty. Uh, but So it's not going to be on that level, but it's still going to be religious oppression in that they're specifically saying what you can and can't do, that is the government, the state, uh, and uh, anyone who objects to that uh, is uh, likely to be punished in some way. So this is going to start here, obviously, with the English Reformation. So uh, if you've forgotten, Henry VIII uh, and then his daughter Elizabeth I, they're going to, of course, uh, form and then reform the uh, Church of England. We call that the Anglican Church. It's the same thing, though. Uh, and that's not just like, hey, this is one of our churches. Like, this is the church, and the head of that church is the monarch. Uh, he called himself, I think, the supreme, uh, the supreme head of the church. I can't remember the exact title. Uh, Elizabeth's going to have the same idea, but she's going to be called the uh, supreme governor. I think that's still the name they have in England. So technically, the monarch is the head of the church in England, kind of like the pope was. So they make all the appointments of bishops, and, and, and they can uh, they have some say in at least who's in those councils that makes the decisions as, as for what they do. Uh, so there's several things they do. Of course, they make the uh, monarch is the uh, head of the church. Uh, that was with the Acts of Supremacy that did that. They both passed their own. Uh, and also they're going to uh, manage these, uh, pass these acts called the Acts of Uniformity that basically say exactly what the Anglican Church believes and practices. Uh, so a lot of people won't be happy with this. Obviously the Catholics aren't happy because they kicked out the Pope and the uh, uh, his ability to select judges. Uh, and uh, Catholics and although to a lesser degree, uh, but certainly also upset are going to be uh, different groups of Protestants who want to get rid of all the Catholic stuff, but uh, uh, Elizabeth and Henry keep some of the Catholic stuff and just hand the power to them instead of the Pope. Uh, so actually, deformity are going to basically enforce uh, or, or dictate what these churches have to practice and do in them. Uh, and they're going to do that with a book called The Common Book of Prayer. Now, I don't want to make it sound like it was optional to ignore this before, but uh, for most of that 16th century, not most of it, but up until about the 1560s, uh, because he's early 16th century, early 1500s, and uh, Elizabeth is more so the uh, middle to late of the, the 1500s. Um, so for a good chunk of, of well, her, Henry's rule, and then not at the beginning of Elizabeth's rule, uh, they're going to change their policy. So I'm not saying that they could people could reject this per se, uh, but if they want to uh, uh, want if they want to try to reform it, uh, whether it's uh, petitioning or just simply refusing to do it in their own congregations and churches, uh, they're going to uh, um, 
crack down on, on what we call dissidents, people that want uh, different policies or practices. So dissenting opinions, essentially. Um, this is going to force, uh, force or determine uh, church policy. And I know most of you are either not religious or not particularly religious, but this was a big deal back then because people were, again, still thinking that these were the reasons for why the world exists and how it exists, and they expected there was some sort of consequence in the afterlife. And maybe you do or don't believe that, but uh, just know that it's not as common today. In fact, it's not common at all compared to how it was uh, back then. So picking these things actually mattered to most people because that they thought that would mean they would either go to heaven or hell, uh, depending on what they were doing. So they passed these acts, make them head of the church, them being the monarch, and then pick the specific rites and rituals and practices of that church. And there's a lot of people who disagree. So there's a couple people that, groups that do disagree. So obviously Catholics do, because they kicked out the Catholic church. Um, so we know that one already. But there's two groups I want to focus on for a second here. The Puritans and the Presbyterians. A lot of them are in Scotland. Uh, here's the disagreements they, they essentially have. The Puritans uh, want to purify... Purify the church, Anglican Church, of Catholic uh, policies. So any of the rites or rituals or practices, whether it's how they're performing communion, what prayers they're saying, uh, uh, whether it's the monarch picking bishops or having bishops at all, uh, they want those elements out of the Anglican Church. And they want to adopt all of the or most of the purely Protestant, specifically Calvinist policies. So just know the Anglican Church did not get rid of all the Catholic policies. Uh, and these Puritans wanted it to, uh, or at least what they thought. And the Presbyterians uh, were not exactly the same as Puritans, although you, you could technically lump them in, I guess. But uh, Presbyterians want to focus more on just the fact that the monarch chose bishops, which would uh, choose policy and then uh, regulate what churches could and couldn't do in their local areas. So instead of bishops uh, being chosen by the monarch, they wanted to choose their own church leaders, uh, referred to as uh, presbyters or presbyters. Presbyters? Uh, chosen church leaders church leaders church leaders uh, chosen by the lady the regular people so not uh, from a bishop or from a, a monarch choosing it um, and again those were enough for people to disagree to the point that they felt like their um, what's the word I'm looking for spiritual lives were in danger, so they actually carried quite a bit. Of, and there's more than just those two. There's a whole bunch of other smaller descending groups that develop, uh, like the Quakers, for example, who I'll briefly mention. They were more radical. Uh, they rejected all forms of any form of church hierarchy. Uh, and they, they, that was the head of the name Quakers. They quake before no man uh, or anyone. They only listen to uh, the connection they have directly uh, with God, which I'll mention that later. So I'll put, I'll put Quakers in that group as well. But they'd certainly be considered radical dissidents. Uh, and there's others. But uh, these groups all disagree with these policies. So uh, as uh, locally they would agree, or, or sorry, disagree with them and, and disobey uh, or violate these policies of the Book of Common Prayer uh, or challenge the authority of the bishops and the monarch, uh, Elizabeth cracked down on it with the, um, uh, what was it called? Clarendon Codes, I think? Clarendon. I always forget. I believe that's it, though. I'll double check. If it's wrong, I'll, I'll correct it in the uh, comment section. Uh, these were passed from 16, 1561 to 65. And like, oh my gosh, why are you giving me all these documents from England? Who cares? The reason why you care about this is this is what drove so many people, or part of what drove so many people out of England into the colonies uh, to form the British colonies here. Uh, and the beliefs that they carried over with them uh, are uh, foundational beliefs that are, that are codified uh, and uh, uh, layered into or form the foundation of our, our government constitution. So these codes essentially said, if uh, you don't accept the policy of the Anglican Church uh, and the uh, practices of the common, uh, Book of Common Prayer, like you decide to gather in groups of more than five to talk about your issues, uh, whether they're Puritans, Presbyterians, Quakers, whatever they were, or Catholics, uh, or if you refuse to adhere to some of the uh, um, rites written out or rituals written out in this Book of Common Prayer, uh, you're essentially going to be punished for it. Uh, again, not quite as harshly as we've seen uh, Catholics uh, or, or Muslims or uh, Confucianist uh, Tang Dynasty in China treat people, but uh, it's still limiting. There are actual legal penalties for it. So uh, failing to adhere to these, failing to adhere to uh, Anglican practices, uh, 
it wasn't all of them, but a lot of the specific ones that come with the prayer practices or gathering for the purposes of celebrating in a different way, um, uh, resulted in uh, civil penalties. Penalties, and depending on the infraction or forfeitures. Uh, so what that means is they could um, place a fine on you. They could limit your uh, position in a government office. Um, uh, they could limit your uh, availability in the economy um, with, their, with their civil penalties. Uh, or forfeitures, they could, depending on the scenario, uh, take from you uh, either money or a position or right or property. Uh, and again, it's going to depend on the, the scenario exactly. Uh, but those are the penalties. And that's enough to, to merit people objecting, uh, but having to comply and, of course, being upset by that. And if you believe these things uh, seriously enough, then uh, you're willing to do something about it. So some do stay and move for reform. Um, and part of that was involved in the English Civil War to some extent. Uh, but a lot are going to choose instead to leave uh, later on, about 100 years later, uh, around the time of the English Civil War or just after it. They're either going to go during or after it. They're going to go to the Netherlands uh, because they are going to um, have religious freedom in the Netherlands. Or they're going to choose to emigrate uh, to the British colonies, uh, which are being started here in the Americas. Um, in roughly the, uh, well, they, they try some in the late 1500s and fail, but uh, they make their first successful one in, in Jamestown in 1607. And then what we know is the 13 colonies, which are, of course, now uh, various states. Uh, they're going to uh, uh, begin to go there because this far away at this time in the 1600s, uh, the English church uh, and the king of England don't really have the resources or authority to, to send officials out there and regulate and manage them. So they will get away with ignoring some of these policies. So that's going to, of course, uh, how do I phrase this, uh, incentivize uh, dissidents. centers rather uh, to emigrate to the Netherlands obviously we're not going to talk about them uh, but we are talking about some of the pilgrims and others that are going to settle over here in um, uh, the British colonies okay so that's going to be made and I'll, I'll add that here too so this is about the Anglican Church uh, persecution uh, where they're forcing them to uh, um, adopt their policies uh, under threat of punishment. And then this section will be more so about the, um, uh, the new colonies, the colony formation, new world, new world uh, slash colonies. And the reason why I focus on this is there is a distinct identity they're going to form here, and that's going to profoundly influence what they do and, and, what, uh, and, and motivate them to eventually break away uh, and form our U.S. Constitution and the ideals that they uh, that they believe in, that they carry over, are they going to be uh, indoctrinated, not indoctrinated, but implanted into the uh, documents, our foundational documents. So um, this is only possible for them to even come over here, actually, because uh, the English are going to defeat the Spanish, and in, in, specifically in 50, 1588, they uh, de uh, decimate the Spanish Navy. Uh, and in the late 1500s, Spain kind of controlled the Atlantic. So England and France and others couldn't even really get over to the New World, essentially, other than Portugal. Um, but uh, once the Spanish had been kind of um, humbled and uh, their, their navy substantially uh, destroyed or hindered by Sir Francis Drake and others and, and some storms, that's going to allow the English to actually get out. So they actually try in the 1580s to sell, settle here um, in the Americas. Uh, you may have heard of some of those failed, like Roanoke, uh, uh, where they, uh, the, the, the famed uh, settlement, I think it was 1587, that when they came back with supplies a year or two later, everyone was gone and never found any trace of them. Uh, but anyways, so they, they are able to, uh, able to settle colonies uh, after 1580s. The Spanish were defeated, the Navy defeated. Uh, and they're able to sell here. So they do. Uh, and we have a lot coming over. We have the first one, of course, is going to be in Jamestown in Virginia. Uh, and shortly after that, you're going to have uh, also people coming over and settling up here uh, in uh, 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 Massachusetts Bay, the, the, the Plymouth um, uh, colony. I can't even think the word colony. Settlement uh, for uh, the Puritans. So 
very quickly, we do have these groups uh, jetting out. And again, I want to point out um, some of the commonalities that these uh, guys are going to sell. So we have the first one, of course, Jamestown uh, in 1607. I don't, have, I don't have all the years for all the other ones. I think it's 1620 for the Puritans. Uh, Plymouth, 1620. I believe that's the year. Uh, Maryland, I don't remember the year for that one. I want to say it was 1630s. I might be wrong about that. Uh, but they settle at Baltimore, or what becomes Baltimore, the city named after Lord Baltimore. Uh, I want to say 1630s. That I might be wrong on the year here for Maryland. Uh, but these are going to be known, of course, later as expanding to Virginia, Maryland, Baltimore's up in here, and then uh, uh, Massachusetts, Virginia, Massachusetts, and Maryland. Maryland, of course, uh, because they're going to be Catholic predominantly, and that's what I want to point out here. Uh, Jamestown's going to be much more of a, uh, a company-driven one. In fact, I'll just put that up here, company. So that's an economically driven one. Uh, the London Company set out and they established their company with a charter. They were there to find gold and, and whatnot, but they unfortunately found none. But they did find that they could grow tobacco there, so that, that did help them out. Um, Plymouth is going to be mostly Puritans, of course, escaping this um, religious oppression. And then you have, uh, uh, in Maryland, you of course got uh, dissident Catholics looking to escape. Uh, England and their uh, oppressive practices, and also too, we'll say I don't remember what what city they, they established and what their exact first colony was. I think actually it was just a, a land grant, I believe, for helping the king out. Don't quote me though. But we'll put Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania, and that's going to be uh, settled by the Quakers. Uh, I think it was Lord Penn, William Penn. I think it was William Penn. Pennsylvania. I don't know the years for that. The 1600s. We'll just put. Uh, and he's going to, of course, um, put his name, actually, William Penn. William Penn, Pennsylvania. And he is actually a uh, Quaker. So they founded those areas. So you have, like, the Dutch, it was now New York, and you had, where were the Swedish? They were up in Chesapeake Bay somewhere. Oh, they're Delaware, actually, I think. Um, yeah, I think they were Delaware. Regardless, um, you had the, the Dutch and Swedish there too, but the British absorbed those colonies pretty quickly. Uh, and what you're gonna have is some commonalities amongst these. So for these last three here, uh, that are gonna be formed Massachusetts and Maryland, and then what was the other one? Oh, Pennsylvania. These are all, of course, gonna be religious communities that are set out to uh, um, avoid Anglican control of religion. Obviously the Jamestown one and others are gonna be uh, not specifically religious, but that's going to be big and what's going to be popular and not that they're all going to practice it But because there's so much variety of religion and they all have come over for experiencing a similar uh, set of problems and issues with the English clamping down and, and controlling their religion and punishing them for not obeying the, the Anglican uh, uh, Faith uh, the way it's written out in the common book of prayer and other things um, Again, they're all going to agree with this immediately, but it's going to be fundamental in U.S. history and Western history for establishing religious freedom. So that is uh, the right to choose your own religion uh, and in fact that the state has no religion. So uh, in England, for example, they have and do have the Church of England. At least back then it was official. That was it. All you could be. Uh, we're going to actually adopt uh, one of the Enlightenment ideals, which is uh, going to be, all right, so we have so many religions and a lot of them came over here because they're fleeing religious oppression. And we've seen how states and religion can work together nefariously and damage people. So let's get rid of that and say the only rule we really have about religion is uh, your right to practice whatever you want and nobody can stop you unless you're like literally harming other people physically. Obviously human sacrifices are out and things like that, but uh, if you want to be uh, Muslim or, or Hindu or Sikh or uh, Christian, you know, whatever version of that or anything, you can and no one can stop you from doing that. In fact, the state will actually protect your right uh, to choose. And that's going to be large because we have so many groups coming over fleeing this persecution. It's going to be a very important fundamental uh, feature for them. And just simply the fact that since we're going to have so many uh, different types, whether they're Presbyterian or Methodist uh, or uh, Quaker or you know any of the, any of the ones we talked about are Catholic, uh, they're going to want to protect that right. Okay. Uh, and the other groups that we had, so that's, that's a common characteristic. So uh, all despite differences, uh, one thing they did unify, you did unify them, unified uh, by desire or religious freedom. Now again, they might not have agreed that everyone should be able to practice whatever they want when they initially came over, like the Puritans certainly don't. Uh, but 
uh, because they came over fleeing that persecution and later on they realize how many different groups are there, uh, that's going to become a, a fundamental American or Western ideal, uh, at least after the Enlightenment. Um, another feature that's going to unite many people is going to be the fact that you have a lot of religious people coming over, generally with families and, and large groups, but you've also got a bunch of uh, independent uh, people coming over for economic purposes. So it could be in the form of charters uh, from uh, uh, the king himself, which is basically just a written agreement saying your company can be the government in this area for a fixed amount of time. Uh, and eventually when you guys are stabilized, and of course you get to keep your own profits and manage your own land there and run as the government. Uh, but for a certain period, uh, or uh, if you've proven to be um, uh, unable to manage on your own, then the government, the crown actually takes over. That's what's gonna happen for most of these colonies, but most of these guys uh, come over as uh, independent-minded people. So they're in search of uh, search of wealth, right? So they're independent laborers looking to uh, find gold or something like that, or, or get land, because that was the main form of, of, of wealth back then was uh, land, and there was plenty of it to be had initially. So uh, they're looking they're in search of wealth, whether that's um, um, you know minerals or metals like, uh, like gold, or land, because again, that was also a major source of wealth back then. Uh, and especially when disease and uh, uh, skirmishes uh, chased out the American Indian population, so there's a ton of uh, land to be claimed by the settlers. All right, and again, I'm not endorsing what they did, but um, uh, that nonetheless was, was a factor. So search for wealth, um, or they were just entrepreneurs themselves. Obviously, you could be an entrepreneur in this group as well, but I mean specifically companies coming over uh, uh, with the initiative of, of establishing their company and expanding it. Uh, you also, too, which becomes increasingly popular, is uh, English convicts. For a long time, they would just uh, uh, send prisoners over here, uh, essentially to exile. Uh, so routine prisoners or prisoners they didn't have room for, uh, or even like the less violent ones, uh, perhaps. Uh, if they couldn't hold them in England or they, it wasn't tenable to keep them there, in prison or in society, they would just drop them off over in the colonies where it was uh, more open and they had more uh, room and, and less, less havoc to wreak uh, on English society. Uh, but also, specifically in Georgia, where is it? They're going to actually uh, begin a government that is specifically designed to take in um, the deserving poor, so those that are indebted or poor, uh, and it's going to give them a chance to sort of uh, have some space uh, and, a, and a restart to, uh, to uh, society. So you've got uh, a lot of poor indebted people. So this is a, uh, this is a very um, eclectic or random mix of people. But again, these uh, folks here have something in common, um, except for maybe the criminals. But most of these people are independently minded already. So they're making the decision, again, the convicts not so much, but other, of course, a lot did choose that instead of imprisonment uh, or fine. But regardless, um, so I will say they all, they all somewhat chose uh, to come here. Um, they're making that decision, whether they're selling their own labor, coming over as an indentured servant. Obviously, slaves didn't come over intentionally uh, or of their own will. But um, indentured servants gen generally did. Um, and then uh, anyone else looking for riches, they're going to come over independently minded, looking for uh, their own way to carve out their own destiny or will. And that's going to be a big part of um, influencing American culture as well, because Americans are famous sort of for that spirit of of entrepreneurship ship or, or, or do-it-yourself mentality. And that could be found all the way back to our origins because that's largely the people who came over here. People seeking free freedom from persecution religiously and people seeking to uh, uh, craft their own, form their own identity and wealth um, uh, by coming over voluntarily at a time when it wasn't easy. It was expensive and dangerous and unstable uh, to come over, especially the beginning, uh, the first few decades of the 1600s. Uh, by the 1700s, it was a bit more... Um, safe and reasonable and manageable. Uh, but certainly the people who came over in the early decades of the 1600s, uh, it, was, it was high risk. Uh, so you have a whole bunch of people that are independently minded, independent, and uh, <clears throat> minded in spirit. So we have a, a large variety of people, uh, and um, the one unifying principle is either escaping persecution or they're uh, of course, driven and motivated to carve out their own existence in life and better their own circumstances. So that's a that's a big unifying theme of a lot of uh, uh, these colonies, uh, and that's going to be embodied in, in the American attitude going forward. Um, 
into the you know 18th and then of course the United States in the 19th, 20th, and 21st centuries. Um, okay, so this is all, these are the people that are coming over. But what's important to know, uh, besides the fact that they have a, a common set of themes, whether it's their rugged independence uh, uh, or their uh, you know, desire to escape persecution uh, and allow for, for greater freedom, or at least for themselves greater freedom, another factor in all of this is going to be how we in the colonies develop a, an independent identity. Um, so I'm going to focus on that. So I'll, I'll say colonial uh, government slash independent identity. That's kind of our theme here for this part. Um, so first of all, these colonies do come over uh, and they're gonna form unique forms of government, which I'll talk about here, but I wanna talk about uh, the development of a particular phenomena that's pretty important um, and is a major factor in, in uh, leading to our eventual disagreement with the British government and then of course splitting uh, during the Revolutionary War and, and writing of our own. Uh, U.S. Constitution eventually. Um, so at the time, from 1607 till about mm, the 1750s, um, certainly the 1730s, um, well, just understand that as time, as you get closer to 1750, this is less and less true. Um, the British, so the English first, and then of course after 1707, the British slash British uh, were unable, oops, unable to uh, uh, govern or manage the colonies. What I mean by that is it was a long distance from England. It was an expensive trip and uh, England, by the way, is uh, very caught up in their own uh, situation or turmoil, especially in the 1600s and even this early 1700s. Uh, they're at war either um, internally uh, having some uh, the, the English Civil War, for example, or the Glorious Revolution, uh, or wars with uh, Ireland and Scotland in the 1600s, uh, as well as their attempted involvement in the Thirty Years' War, which is a major conflict in Europe. Um, so their their military and and finances are, are bound up in the 1600s, uh, either in an internal conflicts or conflicts with kingdoms right around them or in Europe. Uh, so they are quite busy, and again, they do not have the money or soldiers or resources to go out uh, and you know, set up governments and garrisons and um, um, administer policies. That's why they left it for open for whoever could go. In fact, they were literally trying to get pay paying people to, to settle these, especially the 1600s, uh, where depending on the colony, they would just offer you free land, essentially, large uh, swaths of free land just to come over because uh, they just needed people to settle because they couldn't get enough people. So they don't have the resources to send over soldiers and government officials and uh, start and expand the Anglican church and pick bishops and all that stuff. Um, so what you have is um, uh, low English slash British uh, involvement. So the question is, of course, who's going to govern? And the answer is they themselves are going to be the ones governing. Uh, themselves, and that's much different from England because in England it's very uh, rigidly structured. You got the monarch and the nobles, uh, and you've got, of course, the Church of England, and and they are the ones that largely control what goes on. You do, of course, in the 16th century, have a a wealthy urban gentry, fair enough, uh, but um, they have to share that power to some extent with those other groups. In uh, in the colonies, though, that doesn't exist. There's not going to be any aristocracy. Uh, there's not going to be lords who pass on their uh, titles. Uh, and privileges, um, you know, to their to their to their kin. Uh, there's not going to be an Anglican church with bishops and uh, uh, or soldiers to enforce these things. Uh, and you will have the king issuing decrees and orders and things like that, but uh, not obeying them isn't really going to go noticed. Um, whether the king is dealing with their own issues, or they just don't find out about it, or they don't have the money to send out uh, uh, garrisons or soldiers or missions to fix things, uh, you, you're largely on your own over here. So these colonies develop their own identity because they're still cons considering themselves Englishmen, abiding by the practices of English and using their common law, uh, but they're going to be uh, largely governing themselves. And what's important to note is not with the help of any aristocracy. So no uh, nobles, no royalty, and no, um, for the most part, uh, and no um, uh, clergy there, bishops in the Anglican Church, there to guide them. And remember, people had thought historically that you needed those groups to guide as the wise uh, uh, people, uh, to guide the, uh, 
the uh, uneducated, poor, regular folks, they were too stupid to do it. But we're gonna find out here that's not the case. So uh, low involvement, and that's gonna um, um, uh, allow colonial governments to manage uh, themselves. So uh, you're gonna actually have some of your early colonial governments. So here's a couple examples of them, so colonial governments. Oh, by the way, I forgot to talk, not mention what this is. This idea of not really managing them directly and allowing them to direct themselves, but they still stay Englishmen, um, that's known as benign neglect. Uh, benign meaning like non-damaging, like a benign tumor is one that's not threatening your life. Uh, but neglecting it is, uh, of course, because they're not paying attention to them, they're not helping them out uh, necessarily. If there's a, a local conflict with the French or the Spanish, they're more likely to help out with that, uh, or specifically with local American Indian tribes or other colonies. Uh, they pretty much uh, ignore uh, or neglect them uh, for them to fend for themselves. And of course, it's going to develop uh, their own identity uh, and independent, uh, an independent one uh, in the colonies. So uh, that's known as benign neglect. allows uh, these colonial governments uh, to develop and flourish. And again, benign neglect is basically this, the fact that the English are not really able to be involved, uh, the governments anyway, and the, the English church, so the col colonial governments are largely up themselves to, to fend for themselves, and then they form that sort of independent identity. So they form their own actual states. Uh, they're gonna form uh, their own legislatures, now, they're going to come in various forms, and I'll give you a couple examples. But legislature is basically uh, a body in the government, whether it's elected uh, from representatives or directly elected, where they're going to make laws. So they're going to make their own laws in these uh, colonies, which is sometimes going to be illegal, at least according to uh, the British Parliament uh, and uh, uh, King. But they're going to do it nonetheless. Uh, they're going to form their own legislatures. This colonies form their own legislatures. Colonies form own legislatures. Uh, they're going to uh, levy taxes. So they're going to uh, have their own taxation system, which goes into the government, which they can use to build government buildings and uh, make policies and uh, pay for uh, militia, raise local militia, raise local militia. Militia, of course, means you're not actually like an official member of a professional army or force, uh, but you're like a regular citizen who they would call upon in time of need to get your weapon and meet up and uh, you know defend the colony or, or whatever needs to be done. All right, so they are gonna form their own legislatures, levy their own taxes, and raise their own militia. And this is pretty much uh, on a, in a really fundamental base level. That's really what the uh, government's there for uh, uh, at the earliest stage. It's there to, to maintain social order. And to do that, you have to, of course, decide on what laws are, are there to be done, uh, utilize some money to do the, uh, that, as well as uh, to pay out uh, and for the own uh, defense and upkeep, uh, whether it's uh, sheriffs uh, or uh, the actual militia that's that's going out to enforce these laws and protect the colonies. And they're going to do that. So a couple of government forms that we'll see. Uh, we're going to see in Virginia, uh, beginning in 1619, with a place called the, uh, was it the General Assembly? I think it's the Virginia General Assembly. That's not the important one, that's why I kind of forgot for a second. I'll correct it in the comments if it's wrong. Uh, and that was um, a representative legislature. So basically, they voted for, I think it was 12 initially, uh, 12 non-noble, non-clergy uh, members of these uh, districts called boroughs in, um, in Virginia, including Jamestown and other settlements where they would send their representatives uh, there and they would help uh, decide policies, uh, laws, taxes, et cetera, along with the, um, uh, the uh, uh, initially the company appointed governor, but later when uh, uh, the British or the English crown takes over, and I think 1642 or 54, one of those two, I think it was 42, uh, the British crown takes over, so it's no longer held by the com uh, London company or, or Virginia company they're going to uh, uh, put a, a, a crown uh, appointed governor there. So they're going to uh, elect, elected borough. And again, that's just a district or town. Uh, leaders to make laws with the company 
governor, uh, plus their advisors. And that's going to uh, shift and actually going to enhance the power of these boroughs uh, in number, because they're going to grow in number, first of all. Uh, but this is the, the more famous one that you might see in a push or, or whatever, if you had APUS history, or you're going to have it. Um, uh, this is where, in 1642, I think, when uh, it, it gets handed over the colony from the company, uh, the London Company, uh, or the Virginia Company, or both, uh, and it's going to be um, controlled by directly by the British government, or sorry, the English government at this point. So that's going to be um, when they form the, um, uh, they make this from a one single group, where these, the governor and his advisors meet with the borough leaders. They're going to separate them. So you have the governor and their advisors in one house, and the other house you're going to have entirely just uh, people that are elected from the regular population. Because again, we don't really have nobles uh, or clergy over here or royalty in um, the colonies. So 1642 is the House of Burgesses, which basically just talking about the boroughs, Burgesses. Uh, this is going to be a uh, larger elected body, uh, which of course makes laws. <clears throat> with the uh, uh, crown appointed uh, governor and their advisors. Uh, so that's a, that's, a, that's a major shift over here in Virginia where, uh, of course, you go from the company to the actual government, the official government, but the official government is now including with it uh, not just a company, which may, you know, have been, uh, what's the word we're looking for? Less controversial because it's just a company, but they're actually included in the official government and, and condoning it. Uh, regular people being elected to and being involved in this local government here in Virginia. Uh, so that's a major step. You also have two, I won't go too in depth on these. Uh, you have in Carolina, you have a, a, an awkward system that they uh, revise and, and, and uh, uh, revise and reform uh, to be more of a, a representative assembly. Carolina, uh, before it's split. They're going to have the uh, Lord Protectors, which originally was uh, a group of, oh, was it eight or nine? Or was it seven? Less than ten. Uh, people that were granted authority uh, over the land as if they were kind of like a lord, uh, and they got to decide things. But basically people realized these Lord Protectors didn't do a whole lot for them. They really just made a mess of things. And it was really the actual local colonists that would get together in towns and, uh, and meet together uh, and make decisions and raise militias and, and deal with uh, whether it was hostile American Indians or Spanish or French uh, incursions, uh, they would later reject them or get rid of them. Uh, but the system did work uh, until it was reformed. They didn't like reform because it was disaster. They just realized it wasn't as effective. Um, but they're going to uh, revise uh, into a more uh, rep representative, sorry, revise into a more uh, localized legislature. Revised to local. Uh, legislature. Uh, and in Georgia, you're going to have another uh, weird form here where they basically run like a, uh, they basically going to run like a corporation where it's called, they had a board of trustees. There's no fixed number on it. I think they had about 70 in total uh, across the years. But basically Parliament would give them a stipend, uh, just like investors do for a, a, a corporation when they buy stocks or, or whatever. And these, uh, these trustees had to like make the decisions for the company, or in this case, their colony. Um, and it's going to, uh, uh, run out of favor and, and again they're going to slowly adjust and adopt uh, more localized legislative approaches uh, but they're going to have a board of trustees and that was a weird one uh, that one uh, was uh, not only was it weird because they got the they were the only ones that got like a stipend every uh, year from parliament uh, to to manage things but uh, they had a, a different goal than any of the colonies their goal was to provide i mentioned it before provide a haven for uh, indebted uh, and impoverished englishmen who uh, they believe deserved a, a second chance. Uh, so that contributes to it. But again, that's also gonna be revised uh, uh, as it's less effective. But regardless, um, even though they do revise these governments, um, all of them actually, uh, but this one, these ones change quite a bit. Uh, even though they are gonna revise all of them, there's one commonality. Uh, there's two, common two commonalities actually, this is major. Number one, uh, all of these colonies are gonna flourish. None of them are going to like, you know, implode or, 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 or cease to exist. Uh, be taken by hostile American Indians, because I, mean, I say hostile because there's a lot of them actually were allied or, or assimilated with the, the colonists. Uh, but there were some that were like, uh, you know, trade partners with the French or the Dutch, uh, or they just outright didn't like uh, European settlers at all. Most did though, because they could trade for very useful things 
uh, like metals and tools and guns and not that this is useful, but they also liked uh, whiskey and alcohol. Um, so they would, uh, they often liked trading with Europeans, uh, but they would usually fight for their right to trade with specific Europeans. So a lot of the cause for conflict uh, came more so up here and down here too, uh, whether it was uh, Dutch and French supported tribes fighting English uh, tribes and Englishmen, or it was French or Spanish supported tribes fighting uh, uh, English or English supported uh, American Indians. Nonetheless, uh, I don't even know what I was saying. Oh, all these forms, or I should say regardless of form, because it took many uh, forms, uh, colonies flourished. And they really did flourish too. I don't mean just like, oh, they did okay. No, like they, they, they blossomed. Um, despite several restrictions, and I'll actually give you some specifics here. I'll put it over here. Uh, here's them flourishing. Uh, some stats uh, as examples from in 1650, or 1640. Yeah, 1650, you had around in total 40,000 uh, colonists. I don't know if that's including slaves or not. I don't think it is. I think that's just the, the white colonists. Um, I do know that 1650, the amount of slaves, uh, black slaves were, were incredibly low. Uh, but um, after the 1680s and 90s, when uh, cash crops like tobacco become popular here in the South and in Chesapeake Bay, it picks up quite a bit. But by 1775, I know it's a big jump, but uh, that 40,000 grows to, I think, 2.6 million. And 500,000 of those, by the way, are going to be uh, African slaves, or at least black Africans. I don't know how many of them uh, were, were free men, but I imagine the majority uh, in 1775 were, were uh, uh, still bound to slavery. But regardless, that's a huge, huge, huge jump. Um, you also have another uh, couple of large jumps from 1700 to 1775. Uh, the colonies, as far as their production, the amount of goods they produced and wealth, uh, they're gonna have uh, 12 times uh, more uh, production. So they uh, increase their uh, efficiency as far as economically, I should put economic is going to increase substantially. So their population is going to grow substantially. Uh, they're going to um, uh, increase their production and wealth substantially. Uh, their living standards, which of course basically means uh, how enjoyable your life is, like how, how, how much access you have to things that are considered certainly necessities, uh, but possibly even luxuries. But I think back then it was still based on necessities. So they had access to uh, land and materials uh, and uh, water sources, uh, food, things like that. And they, they really had more wealth per person. Uh, that's what living standard essentially is uh, compared to anybody else at the time, even the Europeans uh, over there, because while they were getting a lot of uh, money from their, their um, mercantile systems and, and colonies, they were still uh, overcrowded uh, and fighting each other constantly. Uh, whereas the uh, fighting over here, while it was still uh, in existence, obviously, uh, was less common. There was a lot more space uh, and land to be enjoyed than there was in Europe. Uh, so living uh, standards, highest in the world. Uh, and these, uh, these systems had worked. They had uh, successfully formed their legislatures, levied taxes, raised local militia. Uh, they had um, successfully formed uh, American Indian alliances uh, to, to, to use their own militia and their allies uh, to uh, defend, and in some cases expand, uh, settlements. So a couple examples. They're going to, uh, in the south here, they're going to successfully end up here in the north too, to some degree. They're going to successfully chase out the French and Spanish uh, incursions, as well as their uh, their affiliated um, allied American Indian groups. So the ones that were pro-Spanish or pro-French or pro-Dutch. Uh, they're going to outcompete them uh, with their militias and their American Indian allies, and they're also going to uh, uh, defeat some major uh, American Indian uh, alliances too. There's going to be the uh, what was it called? The Bacoy? I think it's the Bacoy War. Bacoy War? That was from 1636 to 38. Again, if I'm wrong on those years, I'll correct it in the, uh, in the uh, comments. I believe that one was uh, up in the Northeast, and I believe that was where, um, is this the one with the, the Mohicans? I think this was is the one with the Mohicans, where uh, uh, the Mohican tribe, which was allied with English settlers and traders, 
fought against the uh, 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 Pequoy uh, tribe or alliance that was aligned with the Dutch uh, traders and settlers. Uh, and they actually, the English and their American, uh, and their, uh, uh, American Indian allies, I can't remember the numbers they had, but I know they won. Uh, so they, there's an English victory, successfully defended. English plus American Indian ally. Uh, they wiped out the Pequoy tribe who uh, were uh, either taken as slaves by the uh, English settlers uh, or uh, a large chunk of them were taken by slave, as slaves uh, to the uh, American Indian tribes that they allied with. Uh, and the, the, any remaining ones that weren't killed or taken as slaves just assimilated into other tribes. So that one ceased to exist for the most part. Um, nonetheless, the English were successful on their own. Uh, and also a much larger one, this one is known as King Philip's War. And I know that sounds French, but it's actually not. Uh, King Philip's War. That's actually uh, the name adopted of uh, one of the American Indian uh, leaders. And his son, who was really, really on good terms with the English, his son, uh, Medicom, uh, I believe, does reject the name, but nonetheless it gets the name uh, of the uh, war. That one was from, oh man, 1680. No. Let me think about what year it is. 1680, no, 1675. 1675 to 78, if that one's wrong, I'll fix it on the comments. Um, that one's also a W for the English and their um, American Indian allies. Uh, that one was um, additionally, I don't think that one was based on trade from what I remember. From that, from I remember that one was based on um, the encroachment of land. Uh, so basically disputed uh, boundaries. Um, and what happened was several Englishmen or one Englishman was, was killed. They thought he was Dutch, but he was English. But the English thought that they knew he was English, even though he's Dutch, whether or not he actually did. Uh, so that kind of started some hostilities. And basically it was just a series of, of uh, conflicts and grievances against one another that, that culminated to this eventual actual fight uh, where uh, I think they raided a town and killed some militia or something like that. The, uh, the um, uh, made a common his, his allies and that was when the colonists in New England uh, officially thought that was an act of war, and they organized what was at the time the biggest uh, colonial force uh, that they'd ever assembled. I think it was 1,000 Englishmen, and then like 150 or 200 of their uh, American Indian allies. And they went out and they, uh, they uh, went to war directly with Medicom and his um, American Indian allies. Uh, and there were a bunch of settler towns that got destroyed during this. So it was, it was pretty disastrous uh, for everybody, but the English uh, and their American Indian allies did end up winning, uh, chased them out of the region. Uh, and the important thing here is, so uh, English victory, English colonial victory. The important thing here is these conflicts, they did these on their own. They raised their own militias, they won, uh, and they got no uh, financial or militaristic assistance from uh, England itself. So this really helped uh, strengthen uh, this growing American colonial identity. So they flourished and they successfully defended their um, uh, um, positions, uh, which allowed them, of course, to develop this, this independent identity and this uh, sense of being a, uh, a capable citizen. But uh, even, even perhaps more importantly was all this was done, this flourishing, uh, the su successful governments, the, su the successful defenses, uh, this was all done, and this was the big shocker of the time, without aristocratic or cler uh, clerical authority. So again, it was widely believed uh, at this time and before the time uh, in all the world for the most part uh, that um, at least ones with uh, um, advanced uh, state systems, meaning like, you know, whether they were uh, feudal or, or even go back to the classical and, 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 and city-state uh, empires uh, of ancient times, those sorts of systems were predicated on the idea that regular people, individuals, didn't have any sort of capability outside of their social class. So whether it was a caste system or just a strict, rigid social system like the, the feudal system, they believed that common folk and peasants were too stupid and incapable of learning and running things on their own, that they needed the guidance of the wise uh, aristocratic, uh, aristocratic um, uh, classes, whether it's the nobles or some priestly class, uh, or, or the clergy, as we talked about the priests, uh, or the kings, like they needed some sort of guidance from these wise uh, groups that were, were imbued with these special powers uh, uh, th through God or, or whatever because they're superior 
uh, uh, family history, whatever it might be. Uh, they thought that these, if you asked anybody, they would have thought these colonies, and certainly when they started the United States, would collapse, but it turns out that this was the great experiment that ends up working out very well, that uh, if you give people, and again, it's not the United States did this right out the gate, uh, but you know, across the first 150 years or so of our existence, we increasingly opened up, um, 180 years of our existence, we increasingly opened up opportunity to everybody without any social limitations based on, uh, you know, uh, first of all, class um, would be first, and then they'd opened it up to uh, uh, all white males, and then they, uh, of course, included uh, and enfranchised all minorities, uh, and then women as well, uh, and giving them, removing the physical limitations in, in laws uh, that stop them based on their class or, or, or race or gender. Uh, and we find that individuals are actually capable of learning and governing themselves and, and doing well on their own. Uh, and that was a big part of the shift here around the 1600s and 1700s is the belief that you needed these wise groups of nobles or, or kings and queens or emperors or the clergy to run the economy and to run the government because everybody else was too stupid. But what these uh, new ideas that are going to be put into practice here in the colonies, whether attended or not, uh, are going to show actually if you open it up uh, to more people and, and limit them less, uh, it, people can actually run things, uh, the economy and the government and the military, very well on their own. Uh, and they're going to show that here in the colonies early on, before we even form a nation in the United States. But then uh, afterwards, when the United States was formed, people still expected it to not do well. But it did. It did fantastic, uh, despite having no nobility, uh, royalty, or clergy to, to dictate things, leaving up to just regular people. So. Because of these factors, their success, their uh, uh, independence, and their ability to flourish, uh, that's going to, of course, uh, uh, form uh, a colonial identity. Form and form a colonial identity. Yeah, an independent, capable colonial identity. Uh, and with that identity, they're going to speak up for themselves when they think things are being mismanaged or done incorrectly. So they're, they're going to know, uh, for the most part, English history, especially since it's being made in the 1600s, because uh, as these colonies are being settled, the English Civil War and Glorious Revolution, all that stuff's going on in England, uh, or if it's the 1700s, it's recent past. Uh, they're going to know exactly what rights they're supposed to be guaranteed as British citizens. So first of all, they see themselves as British citizens, because they are. They know that they're capable uh, of achieving these feats and, and adopting English customs and laws, applying it to themselves, uh, and despite not having any noble or clerical overlords, they're going to uh, do well. They're going to expect the same treatment. So, you know, any right to go to Parliament or petition to Parliament um, or engage in enterprise that people in England have, they obviously feel like they should have. Uh, and when the British King and Parliament both essentially say no to the colonists and limit what they can do, limit their abilities, uh, and uh, don't allow them into Parliament. Uh, and they try to, in the 1700s, as, as Great Britain becomes more wealthy and powerful, they try to clamp down on them and force them to uh, abide by their laws and pay taxes and uh, listen to their rules. The colonists uh, essentially say no. They resist because they know what Englishmen are entitled to, and they believe they are, are have shown that they're capable uh, of being uh, of being competent Englishmen, and they deserve those rights. And when Parliament and the, the Crown say no, and they, f they force down on them, uh, they refer to their uh, English history, of course, whether it's the Magna Carta, uh, or it's the uh, English Civil War, or the Glorious Revolution, whatever it might be. They point out that every time a government attempts to uh, control their rights and constrain them, uh, in, in most cases the monarch, that the uh, people uh, had the right and the ability uh, and the authority um, and the power to rise up and, and uh, stand up for themselves and effect change. And that's exactly what they're gonna do. Uh, even though it's gonna be parliament and the monarch, they're gonna basically treat Britain as acting as a tyrannical monarch. Uh, and they, in their eyes, are the uh, uh, Puritans and parliament, parliamentary for forces that stood against the king uh, in the English Civil War and the Glorious Revolution, except this time it's colonists standing up against parliament uh, and the crown. And that, of course, is going to uh, largely uh, lead to leads to our opposition to control and revolution. And of course, we're going to take all these ideals uh, and, and, and tendencies that, and policies that we see have worked, whether it's religious toleration or 
uh, representation for everyone, um, and, and protecting freedoms, and, and of course, very, very uh, uh, keen to the specific freedoms that, that Englishmen have had protected, like uh, levying taxes and, and raising armies in peacetime and not having court, soldiers quartered in your uh, house against your will and um, giving people right to a trial and freedom of speech. Um, all of the things that we've seen in, in the English past already, uh, they're going to, of course, apply to themselves and expand on with the Declaration of Independence and the Articles of Confederation and the uh, uh, U.S. Constitution. So that is why I went through that lengthy process of explaining all of that to you, uh, because we're going to talk about next uh, a few more influences on uh, those ideals, and then we can get into um, specifically what they debated about and what they formed with our early government.